Well, good morning, Hillsboro Church family. I am so glad that you are with us this morning. We have uh, an, an amazing service planned for uh, this morning, and so I hope that uh, you will be encouraged and you will be blessed by it. There are many things that are going to be happening. If you don't know who I am, I'm Pastor Chad. I am the associate pastor here at Hillsboro, and again, I just want to extend a welcome. If you are visiting with us or if you have a prayer request or you just want to uh, let us know what's going on in your life, we would love to have you fill out this connection card. It's found inside the chair right in front of you, and uh if, if you are a guest here, we'd love to have your information on that. Or if you're just kind of going through something and, and you would like some prayer, you would appreciate some prayer, uh, you could just fill out the information on this card. You can drop it into the offering plate or there's a prayer box at the at the back of the auditorium here. And you can just put it in there and, and we would love to, uh, to connect with you uh, through that card. Uh, one thing that I do want you to be aware of, uh, our staff has really been having a, a challenging uh, week, and we have a challenging week ahead with uh, some funerals uh, that, have, uh, that have happened last week and are happening this week. And so we would definitely covet your prayers. And uh, let's, let's also keep, I'm sure many of us have heard about uh, the Richardson uh, family, and uh, we want to keep them in prayer. There's going to be a service here on Friday at 2 o'clock as well. Uh, our dear brother, Peter Kent, um, we want to keep that family, Maurice, we want to keep the entire family in prayer. That funeral is going to be here on Tuesday at 2 uh, o'clock two in the afternoon. And so we just want you to uh, be mindful of that and, and keep the families and keep your staff uh, in prayer uh, as we go through that this week. Um, there are also some really other great things happening. Yes, you know, death happens and, 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 and that's part of life. Uh, but there's also uh, some tremendous things. We're entering into the Christmas season. We're in the midst of Christmas season, and so uh, we've got some great services coming up. Christmas Eve service is on Tuesday, of course, at 6.30 p.m. There's only one service here, and so we want you to be here at 6.30. We've got a bunch of surprises. I guess I let that out last week, and now the staff was like, Chad, what do you mean we've got a bunch of surprises? Now we have to come up with a bunch of surprises. And so we're coming up with a bunch of surprises, so you better be here because it's going to be absolutely incredible. And uh, this morning we've got a really great and amazing thing. Uh, we are so blessed uh, and have been so blessed with Megan being here and leading in worship, and, and she's getting married, and, and she's going to be moving on with Philip, and we just want to bless her. And so uh, that's going to be coming up a little bit in the service of laying on hands and praying and blessing her. And uh, as we've been saying for the last couple of weeks, there's a, a money tree that we want to bless her with. And so if you haven't had an opportunity yet uh, to bless uh, them, uh, that tree is just right out in the foyer. You'll see uh, some envelopes out on the tree, and so you can add your envelope there as well. We won't mention those brown bills. I mean, yeah, we'll just keep on moving. As well, there's going to be a New Year's Eve party, and uh, that's going to be a joint thing between Surrey Valley and, and us. And so that's going to be starting at 6 o'clock at Surrey Valley. There's going to be a potluck, and uh, there's going to be a concert, and then we're going to be coming back to Hillsboro, and we're going to be having some games and some celebrations, and I'm even told there's going to be fireworks. So you don't want to miss out on New Year's Eve. Let's just uh, come to God in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for how you sustain us in the midst of everything, in the midst of the busyness of the season, in the midst of, of grief and hardship, in the midst of celebration, in the, in the advent of our Lord and Savior. And God, we just welcome you here into this place. And Lord, we just lift our hearts up to you and worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now at this time, as I said, we got all kinds of great things happening. So I want to invite uh, the Hills Church kids up, and they're going to lead us in special music. More Hills Church kids to come forward? Okay. Grab your shakers. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, boys and girls. I don't know about you folks, but I love hearing from our young people. What a blessing it is to hear from them. I'm going to invite all of you folks to stand with us as we sing Go Tell It on the Mountain.
calls us to tithe, to give to him of our first fruits. And I know sometimes that's a challenge. It's a, a challenge to bring to God what is his first, because we look at the dollars and cents in our bank account, and we say, no, I need to pay all my bills, I need to do all this, and then if there's anything left, then I'll give it. But that's not what God calls us to. God calls us to give to him first, and in fact, he tells us in Malachi to test him in this. And when we give to him first, he will provide for us. Chad and I personally have experienced that over and over again. I remember just a few months ago before we moved here, I was checking our bank account one night and said, oh, Chad, we have bills coming out tomorrow that I totally forgot about, and we don't have money to cover it. The money wasn't there. And then we were just kind of talking and praying, and I said, you know what? I said, I think you should go check our mailbox, because there's a check that, that's supposed to be coming. No idea when. Could be this week. Could be next week. Who knows? Why don't you go check? Sure enough, Chad goes and checks the mailbox. The exact amount we needed to pay that bill was in our mailbox. God does those things, folks. But he calls us to give to him those first fruits. And that's what we set aside this time to do, is to give back to him what he has blessed us with. Why don't you pray with me? Father, I thank you. I thank you for your provisions. Lord, that you give us the ability to work, to earn a living. Lord, and when that's not possible, Lord, you still provide. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for your provision. Lord, help us to be a giving people. Lord, help us to be faithful and always bringing to you first what is yours. Lord, might you take these gifts and use them for the furtherment of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. On the third Sunday of candle, or Advent, the third candle lit on the third Sunday of Advent is the angel's candle, also known as the candle of joy. As we light this flame, we are reminded of the heavenly hosts that proclaim Christ's arrival with, Behold, I bring unto, unto you good tidings of great joy. The angel candle is also purple, reminding us that it was a king's birth the angels were announcing. In Luke 2, 15 through 20, it says, When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the same that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the joy you give us. We ask that as we wait for all your promises to come true and for Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your joy with each other. We ask it in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. A amen. Please sing with us our Advent song, A Candle is Burning.
This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Thank you. 
one of the most awesome things we get to do, especially in the Christmas season, is remember the joy that God has promised us in him. And the joy of being part of his family is one of those gifts as well. And our dear sister Megan went and got herself engaged. <laughs> and so there's great joy for her and for Philip and for the family, and we're so excited for them. But that means that Megan's time with us is coming to an end. And I was thinking about that and wrestling with it because Megan has become a very good friend and a treasured part of our team and our church. She's been here longer than any of our staff, six years. And so for her to go and to just say goodbye just didn't seem right. So we're going to invite Megan and Philip to come at this time. And I choose to see this as not them going, but as us sending. That Megan is going out, and we're going to ask you folks just to come right here. And Megan and, and Philip together are going to be serving the Lord where they're going to be next. They're going out, as, you were, as it were, as missionaries into the context that God has called them to be. And that's something to celebrate. That is the cause for joy. I'm trying to hold it together here, Megan. Because it is a time for tears of joy. Because to send somebody out means you won't see them every Sunday anymore. You won't see them all the time anymore. But we rejoice in knowing that they'll be serving the Lord where they are. Now, we wanted to pray for Philip and Megan this morning, but we wanted to do more than just have a prayer and say the end of it, because Megan has had an incredible reach here in our church. And so we wanted to invite anyone who has worked with Megan over the last six years, either with youth or with worship, to come and gather around behind Megan and Philip, and we're going to lay hands on them and, and pray a blessing on them. At the same time, we know Megan has a real heart for children. And if the children who know and love Megan want to come up here and join us, all the kids that normally come up for Hills Kids, I know you know and love Megan just like we do. So if you'd all come right up here in front, all you kids, come on forward and, and just gather around Megan here because we want to pray for her this morning. There are. They're still coming. <laughs> As you can see, Megan's had a big impact. So let's pray together for God's blessing. Oh, one more coming. Come on up, honey. Father, we are so, so, so grateful for the way you have led, the way you have blessed us through Megan. And Lord, as we, she stands next to the man who asked, asked for her hand to spend his life with her, we give thanks that you brought him into a life that loves you like she does. Father, we pray your blessing upon them, that you would pour out your love and grace your wisdom and strength, that, Father, you would allow them to serve you well wherever they go. And Father, today as we send them out into the fields which are white unto harvest, I pray that as they become a new family, as they love their current families, as they connect with a church family, as they connect with the community around them through work and through play, that, Father, wherever they go, they would truly be salt and light, ministering the good news of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, today of all days, I pray you give them joy. Joy in you. Joy in each other. Joy in knowing that they will always have a family here that loves them and that commits to praying for them. And right now, in the midst, Lord, I just ask that all those who are here, if you would just stand if you would, just extend your hand to Megan and Philip. We ask together, God, that you would bless. Pour out such blessing. Grow them in ways we couldn't imagine or foresee. 
Lord, you've taken Megan from that nervous woman that was afraid to be on the platform to one that leads us. And now you've brought him alongside her alongside a man who also leads. Lord, let them lead well together. In your name, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Hey, boys and girls, we're just going to ask everybody uh, for Hills Kids and Hills Church, sorry, to uh, head on down to the classroom this morning. Uh, we just want to say thank you to Megan for all that she's done in our uh, work with uh, our children's ministry, our youth ministry, our, our senior adult ministry, and our music ministry. There is a money tree out there, and if you have brought a gift, you can place those gifts in the tree, but... From the staff, we have a card and a little gift for you, Megan. Just We thought about giving this to her at the start of the service, but she wouldn't have been able to sing. So, <laughs> <laughs> Can you say thank you to Megan? I'm going to do something mean. Do you want to say anything to these people? <laughs> I had been brought back to the first time I tried to talk on stage, and I sat down, and I blacked out, and I started crying, and I couldn't do anything, so I just prayed, and then we went out. Um, I am so thankful, and I am so thankful to have the opportunities that I did have here to serve in a various, uh, uh, a multitude of ways. Um, and I thank you. I thank you so much for giving me that opportunity and for believing in me and for pushing me to the person that I am right now. I wouldn't be here without you guys encouraging me every step of the way. So I thank you for being a family that loves and cares for me. For the, you know, the first day that I walked in the doors and it was Katrina and Carrie and we're doing youth ministry in the back building and it wasn't even finished yet, um, to being up here um, on stage with the worship ministry. And I'm so thankful for for all of you, and I thank you for the staff also for pouring into me. It has been a blessing, and uh, it has got me here right now. And I thank you for all that uh, you guys have done. I can I pray, and yeah, then we can go. Uh, go <laughs> well, we can go on with what we're doing. Oh God, thank you so much for uh, your love. Thank you that you have sent uh, your son to die so that we could live, and that we could have joy, and that we could have hope. That Lord, I thank you for the family that you have put me in. Lord, that have supported me and encouraged me and lifted me up. And God, I pray that as we go out, that they would continue to do so with the people that are, out, are around. Lord, I pray for the children that have been um, uh, in this ministry, that they would grow up strong um, in your word. And I pray that um, as they grow up, that they would continue to be in ministry and that they would have opportunities just like me. And Lord, I thank you for the generosity uh, and blessing that you have poured out over me and this church family. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, Megan. <laughs> Let's stand and pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. For those of you who are watching online today, we want to say good morning. My name is Pastor Jeff DeYoung, and I'm the lead pastor here at the Hillsborough Baptist Church and of the Albert County Network, a group of churches working together to reach our region for Jesus Christ. As most of you know, it was a challenging week for our community, for our church, family, for our staff. 
we never dreamed just a week ago what we would have, we would have to face. We lost Lillian Steves, a member and former missionary. We suddenly lost our dear brother, Peter Kent. And we lost Isaac Richardson, grandson to Pat, nephew to Derek, son of Angela. It's been a challenging week. Student in his graduating year. And it's in these moments that we need to pause. We need to recognize why we need each other. Because we could not do this alone. So can we just take another moment to pray? Father, you are the comforter. You are the source of our hope and peace. Comfort us now, Lord. Draw near to our brothers and sisters that are feeling this loss the most. Allow us to walk alongside them, to continue to love and support them. And Father, allow us to understand when it's time just to be silent, just to be present. Thank you for the hope we have. Lord, we come to you this morning with our pain, with our hopes, with our fears. And we trust you with them all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I find myself thinking with so much loss, with so many changes in such a short time, that it's really easy to be afraid, isn't it? Spend our time wondering, what's next? What else could happen? This particular season of Christmas, which should be a time of hope and peace, often can be one of pressure as well. And I think we struggle with fear in this season, fear of missing out, fear of being alone, fear of not having enough, fear of doing the wrong thing, or sometimes even, if we're really honest, fear of seeing certain people we wish we could avoid, but they're in our family. kind of ironic how much fear is embedded in a season that's supposed to be about joy, isn't it? Especially when we lose those we love, there's all kinds of questions. What now? How can I go on without them? And yet Christmas is supposed to be about joy. It's supposed to be about joy, not fear. The question in my mind is, how do we get from fear to joy? How do, we, how do we move there? I mean, you can't go anywhere without hearing Christmas carols talking about joy, can you? Joy to the world. Repeat the sounding joy. God rest you merry gentlemen, tidings of comfort and joy. Hark the herald angels sing, joyful all ye nations rise. A holy night, we say, a thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. Perhaps you can relate to that phrase today. Oh, come all you faithful, we say, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. My friends, that's where the joy is. Because Emmanuel literally means God with us. When we're hurting, when we're fearful, when we're broken, the promise of God at Christmas is God came to be with us. He came and made his dwelling among us. He became one of us. And he shared in our suffering and our sorrow and our joy. 
And see, my friends, that's where joy is found this morning. That's how we move from fear and pain to joy, is that simple central idea of how far God is willing to go. That he sent his one and only son so whoever believes in him would never die but have everlasting life. There's a source of joy. Because it didn't depend on us. It didn't depend on what we did. It depended on what he did. But I have to tell you, as we open the scriptures this morning to Luke chapter 1, one of the things we've often forgotten is that even when God shows up in our lives, even when God shows up and brings good news, that news often has profound impact on our lives. God's good news may forever change your life. It may cost you the dreams and hopes and aspirations that you already had in favor of something, frankly, so much better. The one thing I'm sure of is that God's presence changes everything for those who receive him. And if you were going to look at Luke chapter 1 with me, I just want to give you a quick recap before we dive into the passage that we're going to use today. Just to understand that in the scene that it's painted, uh, there's a young virgin woman named Mary really a girl. She's minding her own business. She's engaged to be married. She's excited about her future. She's planning ahead what she's going to do in that context, looking forward to having children of her own and all those things that go with a wonderful, healthy, married life in those days. And then an angel appears to her, an angel named Gabriel, appears to her and says, greetings, the Lord is with you. And Mary's response is fear. She's troubled. And wonders, what, what does this mean? Who am I? Why is God talking to me? The angel goes on to explain a situation. He, he says, don't be afraid, Mary. Now, is anybody here who's ever been afraid had somebody say, don't be afraid to you, and it worked? <laughs> Can we just acknowledge that? Somebody telling you to cut it out doesn't usually work that well. But nevertheless, the angel goes on. <clears throat> Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And does Mary start going, yay, favor with God? She's going, uh-oh. Because Mary knows the, how God has worked in history. He, she knows that when God shows up and somebody finds favor with God, that means he's going to give them something to do. Sometimes we're praying, God, show me your will for my life. Don't ask that question if you're not ready to do something. She's troubled, she's fearful. Angels are fairly intimidating and she's a young, single, virgin woman with, a, with an angelic being in the room with her. She's not going, this is wonderful at that moment, most likely. The angel goes on and says, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Wait, what? The angel explains to Mary how this is going to happen, that God's Holy Spirit will overshadow her and she will become pregnant. And Mary, surprisingly, says simply this, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. I mean, God just rocked her world, didn't he? I mean, he just changed her entire future. She's young, she's a virgin, she's engaged to be married, and suddenly all of her plans are out the window. She says, may it be, be as the Lord has said. You know, so we have a temptation there, I think, to go, oh, wow, she was really mature for her age. She really handled that well. But what else do you say to an angelic figure who just told you what God's going to do? Now, to be fair, a lot of men in history argue with God, but Mary knows better. This young virgin woman who's engaged and is suddenly pregnant knows the law. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 20, it says this, if a man marries a girl who has claimed to be a virgin and then finds she is not, listen to this, they shall bring the girl to the entrance of her father's house, to the front door of her dad's place, and there her townsmen 
shall stone her to death. Don't tell me Mary wasn't afraid. I don't believe it. I believe that young girl knew exactly what the implications of God's plan were, and at that moment she began to think about, "Uh uh-oh, what am I going to do now? And so we'll pick up in Luke chapter 1, verse 39, with a young woman who starts with fear. And we know she starts with fear because she didn't go, gee, I guess I better get ready to go visit my relative for a while. It says, in those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. Just hold it there. Just think about this for a second. A young girl, she could have been as as young as 13 to 15 years old, because that's how young they were engaged back then, makes a journey of three to five days, most likely, from where she lived to where it's described she went, could be as much as 100 kilometers. We're not sure exactly where in the hill country that she went to, but we know it's about 100 kilometers from, from home base. So this young 13 to 15-year-old girl grabs the few things she can manage to grab and and hits the road, a road that she knows in those days there would have been thieves and bandits out there. It's possible she tried to travel alongside her with a caravan, but it doesn't tell us that. It's just three to five days to think. Anybody here ever get in trouble when you thought too much? Something's just happened and you don't know what to do about it and you're given time to think? Does that make it better or worse usually? Because by the time we're done thinking about it for a few days, we've thought ourselves right into a panic. Just because we're human beings, right? We're we're so good at picturing all the negative outcomes. And and, and we, we worry about the negative incomes. Mary knew the consequences of getting caught. She didn't go tell her fiance, listen, buddy, I gotta take off for a while. I'll be back. It's gonna be like there's there's no record of any conversation there. It's just that she went with haste. She had time to think about the consequences of what the angel had said would happen to her. And if you think about it, any, any, any young woman, any young family who's ever gotten pregnant with their first child, they dream a little bit about what that child might be like. You know, will it be a boy or a girl? Will, it, you know, will they grow up to be a doctor or a lawyer or a landscaper? What will they be? And Mary never was, she wasn't allowed to dream, was she? In fact, as a young Jewish girl, she would have been fairly aware of the fact that the promised Messiah was going to be one who would come and would have some struggles, that his job would be to save his people. Now, she may not have known the cross was coming, but she knew something tough was coming, so she got to anticipate and start thinking about, and even if I survive, even if I have this kid, something hard's going to happen to my child. Who here wants hard stuff for their children? I mean, really, we want good things for our kids. Fear was a reality for this young woman. It must have been. And so imagine her surprise. She she makes it to her relative Elizabeth's house. It says in verse 40, she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. We heard about Zach and Liz there a a week or so ago. We talked about how God had given them an amazing thing. She gets to Liz's house. Imagine Mary's shock. Wait a minute. Liz, Liz, you're not supposed to be pregnant. You're old and full of years. She's six months along, Liz is, at that point. She greets Elizabeth. She says, I'm here, hi. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. (laughs) And she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Hold it there. Just soak in that for a second. Mary's just got there. They didn't have email and telephones and ways, you know, it, they didn't have any way to communicate. 100 kilometer journey, it's not like anybody could have beat, you know, Mary there with the message. By the way, Mary's on her way and she's knocked up. <laughs> we keep sanitizing the story. We're so used to seeing this this perfect little picture. Friends, this young woman is in trouble. Her life is at risk. But Elizabeth cannot know that. She cannot know that ahead of time. But God's Holy Spirit shows her in that very moment. The baby leaps in her her womb. So she's six months along. The baby jumps as soon as she hears the voice of Mary. 
And the Holy Spirit comes into Elizabeth, which is really awesome at that time. We forget this because we live in the New Testament world of the New Covenant, where once you receive Christ, God's Holy Spirit comes in, and we're used to thinking, well, he should be there. We should be able to hear him once in a while. But in this context, you got to understand the Old Testament, before Jesus' death and resurrection, the Holy Spirit only came to some people and only sometimes for a limited period of time. Elizabeth perhaps had never experienced the voice of God in her own life personally before. But God came in and said, you need to know something awesome. Mary is carrying the Savior of the world. And of course, Elizabeth can't keep that in. She shouts it out. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. She just found out she was pregnant three to five days before. She spent three to five days worrying about it. And her relative's response is not what she expects. It's pure joy and a call to joy. Of course, Mary's a little bit confused. Elizabeth goes on and says, why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord, listen to that, Elizabeth knew exactly who was in her presence. That newly conceived little embryo would be the Lord, was the Lord of the universe, taking human form. Elizabeth's going, I'm already blessed beyond measure. I already spent my whole life thinking I wanted kids and would never have them. Now here I am, six months pregnant, and now God does this for me? Talk about joy. They had waited. It had been 400 years of silence for the Jewish people. They'd waited 400 years for God to speak again since the last prophet had come. They'd waited 400 years with the hope that somehow God would deliver them from the shackles of being under Rome's boot. And here Elizabeth (laughs) receives such joy. And she could see the look on Mary's face. Mary's a little confused at this point. She hasn't had time to tell her anything. And and here's Elizabeth telling her what she couldn't possibly know. And so Elizabeth goes on and says, listen, verse 44, for behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she that believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Just hold it there. Mary's been afraid for three to five days, trying to figure this whole thing out. What's going to happen? Where are we going? What what are we going to do about this whole situation? Maybe Elizabeth can help. And suddenly Elizabeth turns her entire perspective on its head. Man, you are so blessed. This circumstance that literally puts your life at risk is actually a blessing, a cause for rejoicing, for joy. It's at this moment that the story transitions and Mary's fear disappears. It's transformed to joy. But before we talk about that, let me just clarify something about joy. What is joy? I think we're tempted to think joy and happiness are the same thing. The Bible actually describes at least three kinds of joy. The first one is the joy of a feeling. And there is definitely feelings that go along with true joy. And, and you can feel joy sometimes when, you, when you're fe- doing really well. You can, just, you can just have a really great experience and go, man, I, I'm just... I'm more than happy. I've got joy, this deep abiding sense of just things are good and right. Maybe you've had a a moment of really good fortune where somebody uh, surprised you. I think about a few years ago on my mother's birthday where I was uh, given the opportunity to surprise her up in Ontario. She didn't know I was coming for her birthday party. And just the joy on her face, you know, to see me on her birthday when she normally doesn't get to see me on her birthday because I live out here. Or when I graduated and my best friend from high school showed up on my graduation here in New Brunswick. Joy as a feeling, yeah? And most of us have experienced at some points in our life, joy. When our, when our kids are born, when grandkids are born, joy. Amen, Jeremy? Jeremy just had a grandkid. Joy as a feeling. 
But there's also in the Bible, joy is an action. Joy is an action. Joy is a choice, which is really interesting because we, if, we, if joy is just a feeling, then it's something we can't control that happens to us, right? You think about the book of Proverbs, for example, which commands all of his fellows. Hey, fellows, pay attention now. Philip, listen to me. <laughs> You're about to be a husband. And you've got to keep this in your mind for the rest of your life. It tells us in the book of Proverbs to rejoice in the wife of our youth. Yeah? Now, is that a feeling, fellas? Or is that a choice? See, if you choose it, the feelings will follow. But if you don't choose it, if you don't choose it, you'll often wonder, why is it I have no joy in my life or in my marriage? We have the book of James, which James always makes me crazy because James says something that applies specifically to this week, to the experiences we've had just this week. He says, consider it joy when you face trials of many kinds because through these trials, your faith develops perseverance. That our faith is strengthened, our faith grows when we go through these trials. I wish I could learn the easy way. Anybody here learn the easy way? No, no, we learn it by what my mom calls the school of hard knocks, don't we? We learn so much more in the hard days about who God is, about who we are. And again, considering it joy is a choice, my friends, to see these hard moments and to find joy in them is a deliberate act a difficult one if we're honest. But it's easier when we understand the third kind of joy in the Bible. See, the Bible tells us that Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Now that cannot be joy about the cross, can it? It was the most horrific instrument of pain and suffering perhaps ever developed by human beings. There's nothing joyful about going to the cross, but his joy, Joy was rooted in his hope, which was what came after the cross. See, when we fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, when we fix our eyes on the reality that God has promised for all who believe eternal life, then whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're suffering with, whatever fear you're facing, you can know it will end and there will be joy on the other side. Even if that suffering lasts this entire mortal life on this earth, guess what, folks? Jesus is coming back, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and there will be joy, everlasting joy. Do you know this promise? See, because sometimes I get to feel joy, thank God. Sometimes I can choose joy, thank God. But best of all, I can always know that there will be joy, thank God. And that's how we can go from fear to joy. Not because I'll have that feeling in my life. You may not. You may be destined to suffer horribly through your whole life. Some people are. When we see children born in this world that starve to death, we see good people succumb to cancer. We lose a dear brother to, to who knows what just this past week, suddenly without any warning, without any notice. None of us knows the day or the hour, but our joy is complete in Jesus. When my dear blessed sister, when I went to see her, the morning Peter died. And she just said, I'm so glad, was her words, that Peter met Jesus before he died. That's joy. And it changes the fear. I wish I could say it made it go away completely. But it helps us move to a better place. Or we do not grieve as those with no hope. Where we can have joy. See, joy cannot be found when we fixate on our circumstances. I wish it could. Even the good stuff. Megan and Philip, I trust your wedding day will be a day filled with joy. I do. But if the only joy you ever had is fixating on looking back at that day, you probably missed something, yeah? The joy... He's found in knowing and serving the living God through Jesus Christ. If we fixate on our circumstances, which always change, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, sometimes the situation's impossible, sometimes it's tragic, sometimes it's miraculous. If I fixate on the fact that a couple of years ago God saw fit to give my wife some hearing she never had before, I'm going to be really miserable today because I'm going to be fixated on the fact that her hearing then got worse again. 
but instead I'm fixated on the God who loves us both and who's teaching us patience with each other as we try and figure out how to communicate when one can't hear the other. I find joy not in my circumstance there, but I choose to rejoice in the wife of my youth that I find my joy in God who someday is going to give her perfect hearing she never had. We can move from fear to joy. And listen to Mary's move. It's so clear. And this part of the scripture is called Mary's Magnificat. It's a song. It's a poetic thing that she takes and, and she just describes her joy. Listen to it. My soul magnifies the Lord. Remember, she was afraid a second ago. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. You want to find joy? It's only found in Jesus Christ. Nowhere else, nothing else will give you joy that lasts. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. She's just so aware that she didn't deserve this opportunity, this blessing that she would be remembered for all of history as the one who bore the Son of God, the mother of Jesus Christ. She recognizes that. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. How many times have hard things come your way and your first thought was, God, why? Instead of praising him because he's done great things for you. You know, the, those trials, those struggles that you're facing that we face together sometimes, what would happen if we chose to consider it joy? No matter what those circumstances, we would be able to celebrate that he was mighty, has done great things for us. Holy is his name. She's rejoicing. And his mercy is for those who fear him. Did you see that? She went from fearing her circumstances to fearing God. See, the fear of God is the awareness of how great he is, how awesome he is, how all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present he is. He's here with us now. He's here with you in every moment. He's constantly aware. He's constantly paying attention. He never sleeps or slumbers. Listen, friends, there is joy in fearing God. That's the beginning of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. It's the place where we find joy. When we stop fearing what's in front of us or what's happening to us, and instead we choose to recognize how great he is. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her for about three months and returned to her home. How pregnant was Elizabeth? When did Mary go home? Nine months. Do you suppose Mary went with some joy? She had just witnessed the birth of the man who became John the Baptist. Anybody here have some joy when you see a newborn? Mary's now three months along. She's not showing yet. But she's not afraid anymore, is she? And the very place she ran from, she now returns to willingly because she has found joy. My friends, that's what I know this Christmas season. That's what I know during this hard week is that we can move from fear to joy. We can move from fear to joy no matter what we're facing, if we'll find our joy in God, in Jesus Christ, his son, in his love and care for us, in his promise of strength and justice, and if we'll just rest in the promise of Jesus. See, his coming means God is with us. We are no longer alone. That he's for us, and that he'll walk with us even through the darkest valley, and it's a dark valley when we lose those we love. But he walks with us there as well. Can we just recognize that fear is a normal, natural, and necessary part of our lives, but that we don't have to stay afraid 
The joy is a choice. The choice to trust in God. To rest in His promised Son, Jesus Christ. Now, today, I just invite you to move from fear to joy. To choose to keep your eyes on Him. God with us. Jesus Christ. Look to God instead of your circumstances and rediscover. We, we talk about hope and peace and joy, don't we, at Christmas with Advent? When we have hope, we find peace and joy if our hope rests in the Lord. And His joy, the hope we have, is that His joy is everlasting. Would you pray with me? Lord, I'm just truly grateful this week. You knew before the things that happened that we would need to be reminded of joy. Lord, you knew before we made any plans what was coming. And Lord, we don't understand. And so we found ourselves afraid, wounded, grieving. Lord, remind us today that we can choose to move from fear to joy. If we'll keep our eyes fixed on the one who saves, the one who came, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ. And Lord, it's in his name we pray. Amen. We invite you to please stand with us as we declare joy to the world. The Lord has come. We do have joy, and we have joy in sending out our dear sister uh, to serve in another place and time. So we're going to ask Megan and Philip if they would lead us out today after the benediction is done, and we're going to have a time of fellowship and sharing in the foyer, a chance for you just to say thank you and chat with her for a few moments. There's cake and uh, coffee and tea, I believe, and we're just going to share that time together. So we do invite you to stay for a little bit. Uh, So let me just pray as we close our time out together. Lord, we are so grateful for the joy that we have, the joy that we found in Jesus Christ. Lord, wherever any of the ones in the room are today, whatever they're wrestling with, whatever uh, great things have happened, whatever tragic things have happened, whatever losses they've experienced, whatever uh, things have been found, Father, I pray that you would help us all to choose to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the source of joy. Lord, you're the author of our hope. You're the perfecter of our faith. Help us to rest in you today. Lord, as we celebrate with Megan and Philip, with her family, as we send them out, Lord, allow us to continue to joyfully remember them in prayer. 
to continue to pour, ask your blessing upon them. And Lord, we pray that you would guard them, lead them, and guide them in the days to come. Give them peace as they approach their wedding day. Lord, allow all the details to come together. And Lord, thank you for them, we pray in Jesus' name.